as a kid growing up, uh, hymns were a part of pretty much every service that we had. And there was an old hymn entitled, Standing on the Promises. Uh, just read a couple of the stanzas to you. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. <clears throat> standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. For as long as man has been around, Man has constantly tried to pursue a right relationship with God, but they've gone about it all too often in the wrong way. We are in the middle of a series entitled Finding Peace with God, and we're only going over a section of the letter of Romans in this particular series. Over the course of the remainder of our year, we will go through the book of Roman and Romans in its entirety. But if you were with us three weeks ago when we... <coughs> left off in the book of Romans. We took a two-week break. Doug filled in for me two weeks ago. And then last week being Mother's Day, we did a Mother's Day topic. But on that particular week, we, we addressed four verses found in chapter 4 of the book of Romans, verses 9 through 12. And if you were here, you'll recall, if you weren't, you're kind of being brought up to speed, that as Paul is writing, he's writing to uh, the church in Rome. There are a lot of Jews who are part of the church in Rome. People who had really taken great confidence and great pride in not only who they were, but the fact that they were a people set apart by God. It was uh, evidenced in the fact that they had been circumcised. They placed great value and confidence in the circumcision. And they were also people who placed tremendous confidence in the adherence to the law that God had given them. And so as Paul's writing this letter, he's very much aware that they are under the impression that the confidence they have in, in things that they do, obedience to the law, and getting circumcised, they, they banked on that, that that was enough. That they would be declared righteous because of that. There were people who took tremendous pride in that and gloried in these two things of circumcision and the law. And Paul, as he's writing, he's arguing. And as he's arguing with them and pointing out the reality that you guys are not getting it, he hits them square between the eyes. He says the reality is that circumcision, if you remember that week, had nothing to do with Abraham being declared righteous before God. In fact, he was declared righteous before God long before circumcision ever took place. That would come 14 years later. So it really shot a hole in the argument of the Jewish people. But if you remember, he also went on in verse 11 of chapter 4, and he said, and explained why circumcision itself was actually given. He said in verse 11, and it's not on the screen, just listen as I read it. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness that he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised. So then... He is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. As he's talking about this, he explains that there was a reason for giving circumcision. It served two purposes. It served as a sign and served as a seal. As a sign, it was the evidence that Abraham truly did belong to God. He was a person set apart for God. But he also believed in the promise that God had given him. That he would become a father of many nations. Keep in mind, he's an older man. He and his wife, unable to have children. But yet he held to that promise and believed in that promise. There was a second purpose, and that is it served as a seal. It served as a reminder to Abraham that God, in fact, had not only given him a promise, but you can bank on the fact that God was going to keep that promise. So with that in mind, I invite you guys, if you haven't already, turned your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 13 this morning. 
Before we get there, just hang in there if you would. Today, as believers in Jesus Christ, we too have been sealed. But we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and he says, You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. As believers, yes, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, but we're also spiritually circumcised. But this circumcision is not an outward circumcision that the Jewish men would go through. Rather, we experience a spiritual circumcision. It's a spiritual circumcision of our heart. We read about that in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. And it says there, and in Christ you have been brought uh, brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you also were circumcised with a circumcision, not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him, in your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. This was not just a minor operation that happened outwardly, physically. Instead, what we read here in Colossians chapter 2 is this is the understanding that we're putting off the old nature through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you remember, circumcision is not something that added to Abraham's salvation. It simply attested to the reality of it. Well, these Jews believed that they had a claim on Abraham, a claim that Gentiles did not have. And so as Paul is writing to them, he has a lot to explain to them. He says, while Abraham is the father of the people of Israel, no one's denying that. Yes, he is the father of your nation. But you guys are absolutely incorrect in reaching the conclusion that all the blessings that God had promised were only for Jews. So Paul clearly reminds the readers that part of God's promise, if you remember, part of God's blessing when he gave it to Abraham back early on in the book of Genesis was that he would be a father of many nations, not just one, not just Israel, but the father of many nations. And this is where we pick up Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes, how church? Underline it, circle it, highlight it. By faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless. Because law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. It's important for us to realize our first point this morning is this that Abraham was justified before the law was given. He was justified before the law was given. He clearly states in these two or three verses that Abraham was justified by believing in God's promise, not by observing the law. In fact, the reality is, if you go back and you begin to really study in the Old Testament, it wasn't for another 430 years until the law was given to Moses. And so when it says that Abraham was justified, it was 430 years prior to the law ever being given to Moses. It hadn't been given yet. So this promise that God gives to Abraham in Genesis 15, 
was given purely through God's grace. So Abraham didn't even earn it. Abraham did not merit it. If he earned it or merited it, it's not because of grace. Paul argues then in verse 14. He says, uh, if I hear you guys right, if you're telling me, and I'm hearing what you're saying here in verse 14, if those who live by the law are heirs, if it's simply people who are being very much uh, obedient to the law, if you are the ones who are then heirs, then you need to understand something. Then faith is completely worthless. It has no value. The promise, I should say, is worthless. And Paul obviously jumps on that and he begins to share with them. You know what? You guys are really holding fast to this idea of law keeping as a condition that would ultimately bring about the promise that God had given to Abraham. But if you're going to go that route, you need to understand something. If it's not truly a gift that is based on the grace of God, if it's based on the conditions that man has to fulfill in following and adhering to the law, then there are two effects it's going to have. First of all, it's going to make faith irrelevant. You would take an unconditional promise that God had given to Abraham, and then you would now make it conditional, totally undermining the very thing it was all about. If you're saying that man's obedience is necessary, then it's truly not based on the grace of God, without man being conditional in any sense of the word. I want you to think for a second, if you as a parent decided that you wanted to give one of your children a brand new bike as a gift, you communicate to them, and before you do that, let me just say as an aside, if you're going to promise your kids anything, follow through with it. Because if you don't, they're going to remember it, and they're going to remind you of it. So don't promise them if you're not going to deliver on it. But imagine for a second, your intentions are right. You have every... Every part of you is planning on following through with this promise and you say, son, daughter, I'm so excited. I'm going to give you a brand new bike. You can only see and only imagine the excitement, the, the expression across their face. <coughs> I've got a bike that is coming. But then a week goes by and you say, you know what? I thought about it. I'm only going to give you that bike as long as you obey everything I tell you. If you, if you bow out on anything, if you're disobedient in any way, the bike is gone. That's exactly what Paul's saying here. God, though, is not a heavenly parent who's not going to deliver on his promise. But you guys are putting conditions that basically negate the very unconditional promise that God gave Abraham. And you yourselves are putting conditions on it. That's the first effect. The second effect of being conditioned on law keeping is this. That the promise would then be nullified and worthless. So rather than bringing blessing, the very thing that God had promised Abraham... The law in verse 14, we're told, brings wrath. You see, the law was given to the Jewish people not to save them. We've talked about this. Paul's talked about this earlier in the letter. What the law did is the law exposed man of their need to be saved. It exposed their sinfulness. Let's say tomorrow you wake up and you have this bright idea that you are going to disregard all traffic laws. When you come to a stop sign, you're just going to blow right through. You're not going to think twice about it. You're not going to look any direction. You're just going to, when you see a light, disregard it. You're tooling down the road, you see these flashing yellow lights, and it says 20 miles an hour, school zone. 
45. Woo! Are you shocked? Should you be shocked if you see lights flashing behind you and pulling you over? No. The law is there, and if you choose not to follow the law, what it does is it exposes your sin. And that's what the law of the Old Testament did. And as a result of sin, what it would result in is the wrath of God. And so the law was never given with the intent of saving man, but rather exposing man of their need to be saved. Something much, much different. It goes on in verse 16, really summarizing the verses that we've just looked at. He says, therefore, again, circle the word therefore, and every time you see the word therefore in Scripture, ask yourself the question, church, what? What's it there for? He says, therefore, in light of the things that we just looked at in verses 13 through 15, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, not just to the Jew, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Don't lose sight. God gave an unconditional promise to Abraham back in Genesis. His unconditional promise is that he was going to make him a father of many nations. That was based on God's grace and God's grace alone. But notice, Abraham, he obtained the promise how? By faith. By faith. Not by keeping the law. Why? It didn't exist. This was the only way that the realization of what God had promised could be certain. The fact that Abraham was justified by grace and not by the law proves that salvation is not just for the Jew, but for all men. Jew and Gentile alike. And so what Paul's really arguing here is this, that Abraham is the father of all who place their faith in God. And so how does that carry over to your life and my life today? What God says is this. Uh, what Paul says is this. God justifies the ungodly because they believe in his gracious promise, not because they obey his law. Not given to save man, but to expose and show man of their desperate need to be saved. And what really Paul is saying is there's only one method by which one can be justified before God. And that's through faith in Jesus Christ. One commentator by the name of Mounts said it this way, and I love what he said. Faith is helplessness reaching out in total dependency upon God. It's helplessness reaching out in total dependency on God. And so what Paul's really done here is he's concluded his proof that faith is the only method by which one can be justified before God by showing that Abraham was one who trusted in God by faith and faith alone for his salvation. He continues and he uses the example of Abraham's faith for you and me and for his recipients of this letter to Rome. Look what he says in verses 18 through 22. He said, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. She was 90. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This was why it was credited to him as righteousness. 
Again, God, when he gives a promise, is going to be faithful and he's going to deliver on that promise. All we need to do, as Paul is telling us, is we need to believe. We need to have faith. Notice what he said here. He says, Abraham's hope rested solely on God's promise to him. Think about it. He's an old man. His wife is an old woman. He realized that his body was as good as dead. There was no way that they would produce another life. So he took God at his word. He knew fully well, there's not a chance that my wife and I are naturally going to have a child together. No way. Impossible. But God promised, you're going to be a father of many nations. And Abraham took God at his word. And his hope rested fully in what it was that God could do, not in what nature could ever do. Now think about it. Abraham's a human being just like you and I. He knew he no longer could bear children. His wife can no longer bear children. That's knowledge. And yet, knowing that he also believed that God could be taken at his word, and what could not naturally happen could in fact happen with God, if God so chooses. So he writes in verse 20 that Abraham grew stronger in his faith and he gave glory to God. Then we're told here in verse 21 that Abraham fully believed God in God's faithfulness to his promises, that what God promised he was able to perform. And I think as we understand this, we understand how this applies to salvation very clearly. God has to wait. He has to wait for people, sinners, to truly be dead in the sense that they are able to help themselves. How often people have these ideas that I've got to get my life together, I've got to clean up my act before God could ever accept me. I just need to go to the church. I just need to do this and that. The reality is we need to come to the end of ourselves. The reality is we have to come to terms with the fact that there is absolutely nothing spiritually I can do to be in right standing before God. Can't do it. And it's when we finally get to that point that God is able to then step into our lives and with his saving power save us. But as long as as the lost sinner thinks that he's strong enough to do anything to please God, he cannot be saved by the grace of God. It wasn't until Abraham admitted that he was dead that the power of God then became very evident, working in his body. And you and I know the story. At the age of 100, his wife at the age of 90, they welcomed the promised child that God had promised them many, many years prior into the world, a son by the name of Isaac. It's when a person comes to the end of themselves, acknowledges their desperate need for Jesus Christ, confesses that they are absolutely powerless spiritually, that they are dead spiritually, that God then steps in and he saves them. Remember, early on in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 are really the key verses, but I want to focus on verse 16 for a second. And we'll do this throughout our time together as we go through this letter. Paul writes there, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is what, church? The power of God that brings salvation to everyone who what? Believes first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. We're going to see this play out as he's writing this letter to the church at Rome. It's the gospel that is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's a time when Jesus 
was on earth, going about his earthly ministry. He's approached by a rich man. And he's asked a question by this rich man. It's found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19. And this rich man comes to Jesus. And he... He asked Jesus this question. I want you to listen to the wording of the question. Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Notice how he put it. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? He didn't say what must, the, what must be done to get eternal life. It was about his doing. And that's oftentimes the problem with mankind in general when it comes to spiritual things. Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. The man responds, which ones? Jesus then answers, do not murder, do not commit adultery. Do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your mother and father, and love your neighbor as yourself. To which the young man replied, all these I have kept. What do I still lack, he asked Jesus. Jesus says, I want to be, I want you to be perfect. Go and sell your possessions, give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus' disciples evidently heard all of it. And they said, Jesus says to them, I tell you the truth. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And, I, and again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and they asked, who then can be saved? Verse 26. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible. But with God all things are possible. If it's about what you and I do, we're out of luck. Only God can accomplish that in our lives. Because there's nothing. Impossible for him. If Abraham were here today, I'm sure he would go on for a long time. Hey, there's only one who can receive the credit for the son that I have. It's God. It's God. Paul goes on now and he applies what he has been sharing in these verses leading up to the end of chapter 4. And he applies God's dealings with Abraham to the readers he's writing to in these last three verses. He says in verses 23 through 25, the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, and he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Bless you. Notice what Paul's saying. That God will credit righteousness to all who believe in him. He uses Abraham as an example. He says, you ought to follow the suit uh, in the example of Abraham, just as he trusted by faith in God, you need to do the same. Your confidence is not wrapped up in what you do yourself. Your confidence is in him, in him alone. Paul mentions God's raising Jesus from the dead. He mentions it here to help the readers remember that he's the same God who can bring life out of death. The God whom Abraham believed in. 
It may be easier for us to believe that it was for Abraham. Because we took, we're able to look back at the actual resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, Abraham didn't have that luxury. Abraham anticipated one who would come, who would go to a cross and die for the sins of man and be resurrected. But you and I, we've got it all here. We can read it for ourselves. We can understand it. It's already happened. It's already been completed. Whereas for Abraham, he simply looked forward in anticipation of what would take place yet down the road. And he says here that Jesus Christ was delivered over to death for whose sins? Ours. That he was raised to life for our, our justification. Verse 25. That means that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is proof that God the Father accepted his son's sacrifice on your behalf and mine. When an individual surrenders their life before Jesus Christ, they acknowledge, Lord, I desperately need you. I recognize I am a sinful person. I deserve nothing but the wrath of God because of your unbelievable love your son, Jesus Christ, left heaven. He came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He went to a cross where he died for my sins. And I acknowledge that he died for me. He was my substitute. He took my place. And the day I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I'm saved immediately from the condemnation of sin. I am being saved from the influence of sin through the sanctification process where I am becoming more like Christ. And one day, praise God, ultimately, I will experience glorification where I will be before my God in his presence, completely unable to have sin influence my life at all. That's good news, church. The object of our faith is not outward obedience. The object of our faith is Jesus Christ and him alone. The one who died and rose again. Harry Ironside was a pastor who's now long been with the Lord. He's a Canadian who then became an American pastor and for 18 years, 1929, on, he worked as the pastor at Moody Church in Chicago. He took a vacation. While he was on vacation, he attended a church on a Sunday morning, and he went to their Sunday school hour. He just sat down. The Sunday school teacher began talking, and he asked the question, how were people saved in the Old Testament times? There was a little bit of a pause, and then somebody piped up, and they said, by keeping the law. Ironside interrupted. He says, my Bible says that by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. The teacher was a little embarrassed, a little taken back. And so he said, well, does someone else have an idea? Another student piped up and they said, oh well, yeah, by, uh, by sacrifices. They would bring animal sacrifices to God. Again, Ironside couldn't handle that. So he piped up and he said, my Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. By this time, the teacher who realized he was completely unprepared, he looked at Ironside and he said, well, you seem a lot more educated on this than I am. Would you like to share with us how people were saved in the Old Testament? Dr. Harry Ironside began to explain that they were saved by faith, the same way that people are saved in the New Testament and today. The book of Hebrews chapter 11, we know it as the Hall of Faith. Some 21 Old Testament individuals, men and women alike, <coughs> who were saved by faith. Every single time it was by faith. 
still true today. That people are not saved by adhering to certain laws and standards, by trying to be good on their own. They are only saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. The saving work of Jesus Christ is what makes it possible for any of us to sit here and call ourselves sons and daughters of God. I have for about a month now found myself singing and being ministered to by a song by Phil Wickham entitled Living Hope. I'm going to read it to you. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart can fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried begotten body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. And then the chorus, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh my God, you are my living hope. Let me ask you, is Jesus Christ your living hope? Do you know him? The very one who demonstrated his love for you and me and that while we were sinner, sinners, enemies of God, he came and he laid his life down for you and me. He paid the price for your sin, that and mine. The good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that the Son of God did leave heaven. He did come to earth. He paid the ultimate price for the sins of man. And he did it all so that you and I could experience a right relationship with him. Not based on works not based on man's obedience, best attempts. They're nothing but filthy rags before God, riddled with sin. It's offered and extended to each of us to get to salvation because of the very grace of God. I'm ask if you would bow your heads up for a second. Close your eyes. And as you do so, if you're here this morning never having placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean you have to do it on a Sunday morning in a church service. It can be done anywhere. But it would be wrong of me to not offer you the opportunity to respond to the gospel. How do we respond to the gospel? We simply accept the precious gift of salvation by faith. Jesus Christ, I realize I'm a sinner. I recognize my desperate need for you. You took my place. You died the death I should have. 
because of your grace, you extend to all this precious gift of salvation. Today by faith, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. That's true of you this morning. You've never done that before. Would you just slip up your hand and then put it down? Anyone today, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want Jesus Christ to truly be my living hope. Lord, we stand before you this morning. We sit before you this morning. As a people who have much to praise you for. If we know you as Lord and Savior, Father, we have reason to rejoice all the time. Because we have been forgiven. We have been set free. We are in right relationship with you, not because of anything we have done. It's all because of you and your saving power. And I thank you that it's also a power that sustains us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for loving us. And I pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ.